Hi, my name is Nanne van Dijk. I'm a freelance character artist, in the way I like to say. Um, I design characters, I model them, I rig them, and I animate them. Uh, I work in 2D and 3D, so uh, for 2D animation I, I mostly use TV paint. And for 3D animation I work uh, with uh, Maya. How did you discover TV paint uh, the first time? Uh, the first time actually is way back. I think it was called Mir Mirage back then. Yeah. Uh, it was on my first internship at Lawson and What's His Name. That was a small Dutch uh, studio. And they specialized in 2D animation and they teach it to me. And I loved it from that moment on. And I never switched to another 2D animation program. So I grew up with the beginning of TV paint as well. And then later uh, I worked in a on a feature film uh, working with TV paint as well. Triple Trouble? Triple Trouble, yes. Children's movie about Sinterklaas that's uh, kind of similar to Santa Claus, but then a Dutch holiday, actually. You learned 2D and 3D uh, at school or did you learn by yourself? I, I see that you did the uh, online school too? Yeah, yeah, I started actually uh, at a, a graphic design school, Media College in Amsterdam. Okay. Uh, there I learned a little bit of 2D animation and a little bit of 3D animation. Then I went to the Utrecht School of Arts, where I focused mostly on 3D animation. And after that, I did Anim School, the, so the online uh, school. Uh, and there it was focused on uh, character animation. So what was the differences between learning uh, in a school with other students and in a school online? Yeah, at uh, the Utrecht School of Arts, we, uh, we made entire animations together with the class. And uh, yeah, you, they didn't tell us how to do stuff, just to make it. And yeah, it was more of a trial and error thing. And with Anim School, it was way more hand down and precise on what you were animating. They gave tips and drawovers. And so it was very specific. So yeah, that's the main difference, I, I guess. And now you teach yourself uh, via yeah. tutorials. Yeah, I create, just created a new website. It's called the Character Creation Guide. I really love doing that. So I thought, why not make my own website and make tutorials to help a lot more people than just the people in, the, in those schools. There was something uh, funny, if I can say so, <laughs> yeah. um, about uh, being spe specialized in the character animation, but also doing many things like storyboard and and yeah. you, you, do, you do everything, so how does yeah. it work to, to get uh, the, the jobs you want when you do so much thing at the same time? I guess it actually helped me a lot because uh, in, in the Netherlands there isn't always that much work in animation. Mm -hmm. And because I was able to do like the storyboarding and the rigging and the modeling, I, I could get jobs uh, at different studios and just fill my blank spots with other jobs. and. Uh, I also uh, have a lot of jobs to thank because I was able to do so much. Like uh, I worked on the game Duck World for the Donald Duck. And uh, I, I never worked for games, but because I was able to model, rig and animate, I was the perfect candidate for, for that game to, to be hired by. Was it uh, a little studio? Because I think uh, in the US you have big studios and uh, many yeah. <laughs> specialization. Uh, but in Europe, we have more uh, little studios and yeah. tiny, tiny teams. I really like the tiny teams because uh, you have a lot more to say, actually. Uh, I think if you're working for a big, giant studio, then uh, you just have to do your part and you should shut up yeah. about <laughs> everything else, I guess. And I like that uh, I, I got to talk to the directors and to the, the producing, yeah, the production leaders. And I, I got to have input on so many different things. And, and that's really cool about working for smaller studios. But uh, yeah, it can also be tricky because you have a lot more responsibility as well. You have to make sure everything is correct and working. For Duck World, it was really funny because I was working for Disney. And uh, normally you think, oh, Disney, they have so much people above you, they check your work and everything will be looked at very closely. And 
I didn't have that. I was the only animator there and I <laughs> didn't have anyone. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. I didn't have anyone who checked my work actually, only the, the artists who work for the comic in the Donald Duck. But uh, they were just scared to tell me things because yeah, they didn't know anything about animation. So it was really crazy actually. And I never expected that, so, but it was also cool because yeah, I had to make sure myself that the quality was high enough for a project for Disney, you know? So I learned a lot from that, uh, <laughs> from the game actually. On your website, you also teach how to have a, a good a demo and a good uh, portfolio. So what would be the advice being specialized, being a generalist? Well, actually make multiple reels, I guess. Um, make sure you have a real, especially for animation, make sure you have a real, especially for modeling and rigging, if that's what you like to do. And really think about what the studio you want to work at uh, wants to see in your work. So if you, if you uh, want to apply for a studio that makes commercials, try to uh, put in more commercial-like projects. And if you want to work for a studio like Disney or Pixar, really put in the, the more acting shots and the more the real animation stuff look at what you the studio you want to work at uh, really wants to to hire and now to talk more about uh, the the creative process uh, yeah. how do you think about a character like is his uh, personality but also his design and shape for animation versus for illustration well i think illustration you have to tell a story in one image so it's uh, it's very important to really think about a story if you want to tell a story with an illustration for animation uh, you can tell the story in a longer period of time so i think in both cases it's very important that the personality and the character uh, shows in the design of your character so i think story is very important in that way that you really think about what the character is thinking, what he's doing, uh, where he's coming from, what perhaps his family, try to show that into your character, uh, in clothing and accessories. If it's a guy who is tired and give him stubbles, you know, uh, yeah, it's in the details, I guess. Yeah, because uh, I saw some uh, work in progress for, for animation, for like TV series, and you, you always see the, the silhouettes of the character yeah. and you have the the tiny and large and the, the skinny or long and uh, you want to recognize the character if it's like you said if it's tiny in screen or uh, you want to in one image know who this character is so uh, especially if you have multiple characters and if the silhouette of the character is all the same then you don't know who the character is. So yeah, lineups uh, can be really important and you can play a lot with this and have a lot of fun with it as well. Yeah, with the proportion and making it uh, yeah. not not symmetric so it can be more interesting to see. You did a video about uh, feedback. There was a character and you just said there is too much symmetry and everything is the yeah. same. There is this rule of thirds, I guess. Uh, it's called, yeah, I'm not sure how it's called, but it's like this spiral you can make. If you divide everything as if it's a ladder, then it's a really boring image to look at. If you place it more like one third to two thirds, then it becomes more interesting. And you can play around with this a lot in the design of your character. And it doesn't have to be that perfect one third, one uh, two third, but it's more to do with not having that ladder like design in your character. I, I don't know if you work like that, but do you begin with uh, simple shapes? Yeah, yeah, I start yeah. really rough. It's actually very ugly to see my first roughs, but I really start with just scribbling rounds and just uh, the body. And then I, I redo the, the drawing a couple of times, actually. And every time I go over my drawing again, I try to make the lines better. And it's not just tracing the lines I have. I, I try to improve every time I redo it. I, most of the times I do about four of those drawings, but sometimes it can go up to eight if, if I'm not glad uh, with how it is turning out. And uh, I guess it, uh, it's depending also of uh, the feedback from the team. Yeah, 
yeah, of course, uh, most of the time you start out with just really rough versions because you don't want to uh, have too polished versions because in the early stages of a project, you have to design a lot of different possibilities because you want to give the client a lot of things to choose from. And if you take hours on just one drawing, then yeah, you, you can't show so many drawings. So the client can't pick any. So it's it's good to keep it very loose in the beginning. And uh, if the client says, oh, I like this and this, and then you can just take the, those elements that the client liked and then go on with that. But yeah, the, the first design should be really rough, actually. And uh, do you have to, to face some uh, challenge, challenges like uh, having a character and uh, the client say it's, uh, it's like a, a cliche, you see it uh, <laughs> every time. So how do you deal with this? Did you already did with, uh, deal with this? Yes, yes, I, I did. Um, I'm thinking about how I dealt with it. I guess I just make new versions and try to stay away from the cliches. I uh, I try to get inspired by different things then. I was talking uh, with someone uh, this week uh, who needed inspiration for multiple designs for one character. And I said, yeah, just look at nature and uh, if you're making a mammal, don't just look at mammals, look at everything. So look at fish, look at microbes, look at plants and just take elements you find and try to get inspired by that and yeah, give yourself new feedback and try different angles and uh, try to stick away from uh, the cliches. So the first idea you have, everybody, everybody has, has the same, so yeah. you have to we do, we do, we do it. Everyone sees the same things. So your first ideas are most of the time pretty cliche, but they can also be uh, good, but just don't stick with your first idea. If you like your first one, draw 20 more, you probably will like a different one better by that time. I did a course by Stephen Silver and he said to, to take a lamp, for example, and try to make a character out of that lamp with the proportions and I th I thought that was a really great tip and yeah try to get inspired by everything you see around you and let your creativity flow from that I guess <laughs> and uh, how do you get you your references you get videos you get photos you how do you find them yeah I, I mostly google <laughs> actually I just type in things and uh, it doesn't have to be the keyword you're looking for but sometimes if you think a bit further than that, you can think of keywords that probably be more interesting to look at. Uh, but yeah, sometimes I, I should reference myself. Uh, I had a, a character design job a while back and I, uh, I needed to have inspiration. So I, I went to the Hortus Botanicus in Amsterdam and I just took pictures of, of plants and I thought, uh, that could inspire me. And I used some of those designs to help me with my character designs. So yeah, sometimes uh, it's good to go out in, in nature and just take photos for yourself. And so you have in your computer like uh, folders and folders with many, many pictures. Yeah, and uh, most of the people would think I'm really weird because I'm photographing like tiles and doorknobs and yeah, so, but don't be afraid of that. It's just yeah, go out with your camera and take photos of the most funny things you can see. About uh, designing the characters, we, we talked about uh, uh, character for animation, but yeah. um, do you think differently between uh, a 2D animation and 3D animation to make the shape and how it will have to move? Yeah, definitely. Thing? Yeah, if I design a character that I know has to be in 3D, I really think about uh, how a character structurally works in 3D. So I try to think in round shapes and not just flat characters. You can really have fantastic 2D designs, but that just don't work in 3D. So yeah, I really think about the mass of character to have like round shapes and uh, volume. Um, but also uh, when I have to model it in 3D and rig it, I think about, oh, I, I should have enough space for the neck, for example, if I want to animate this and that. And if I don't have a neck, then it would look 
pretty weird. So yeah, I really think about animation. For example, also uh, a lot of characters have uh, four fingers. This is also to do with animation. If you have a lack of time, then it can really help if you have one less finger to animate. So it's also those kind of things to think about uh, when you're designing a character. So you have that kind of uh, indication when you when you work with a client, you said uh, we have uh, that budget, that time, and then you deal with it to make the creative and the artistic part. If I am rigging a character and I know the animation has limited time, I make sure that there are less controls to, to animate, for example. It really depends on what project you're on and what the character has to do. I always look at storyboards if there are there, so I know what the character should be doing or uh, what the idea is behind the character. And sometimes I don't have it and then I just draw it myself and try out poses that the character should be making before I start to model because then I know what my rig and my model is supposed to be able to do. And it will save me a lot of headache if I didn't do that and I, I made my character and I wasn't able to do the poses that I want the character to do. So yeah, it's, it's good to think about those things before you start. Do you have more freedom when you do a character for 2D animation because you, you can draw with the lines and everything? Yeah, you have to have a really advanced rig to be really free with your animation. And most of the times you don't have the luxury of having a fantastic rig. So yeah, 2D animation is really more freeing in that sense. Uh, you can cheat a lot and I yeah. really love that. Uh, in Triple Trouble there was one shot where I had like this big giant uh, toilet paper roll that has to be fitted in this tiny bag and I could just do it in three frames and it was done <laughs> and everyone believed it. If I had to do that in 3D it would for, first of all, it would look really strange because yeah. <laughs> in 3D you can't get away with that, things like that so easily. And it would be a lot of work to just get that done technically as well. So yeah, 2D is, uh, is liberating in that way. And the character is more looks, uh, looks more like uh, what you did on paper uh, in 2D because uh, there is no, it, it doesn't get in volume and, uh, and physics and things like that. So, yeah, yeah you, in, in 2D, you really have to make sure the character stays on character. I think that's one of the most difficult things about 2D animation. I would suggest for every 3D animator actually to, to try 2D animation because you learn so much about keeping volume and things like that uh, with 2D, you don't really learn in 3D. So I think that a lot of 3D animators really miss that knowledge of animation. Yeah, and also knowing to, to draw simply because you have to yeah. think about uh, the poses and the gestures and everything. So it, I think every 3D animators also make uh, drawing to know how the character moves. Yeah. Yeah. I think drawing is really essential for every part of art you're working with. If you learn how to draw, you, you develop your eyes as well to see design quality in, in poses, also in 3D. And I, yeah, it's so important. And I think so many 3D artists should, yeah, who don't draw should really try to draw, even if it's just stick figures and just easy poses, but just keep drawing, <laughs> yeah. I start with a round and I create like the lines uh, for the volume. It's easier to animate a shape like this than to animate like a complex face and yeah. Uh, so you begin so, with simple shapes, you, you animate yeah. and then you add the details, the eyes. The, yeah, the I, do it, I do it rough because I think it's important to know where the eyes are. So I try to think about strong poses, so a strong line of actions in there. So the line of action is to make the, the pose dynamic? Yeah, it's like this. So if he, he really is looking here, so let's say here is a little Easter egg. By making this curve like this, your focus will go more this way. To emphasize this even more, I'm going to really stretch him. So 
So even with uh, with this character, we can see the contrast between uh, the big head and the tiny body. That, that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You see, if I have the body, you see, it's it's not perfectly. Uh, if I made it really simple like this, it would be a lot more boring character. So everything is about uh, the contrast. Yeah, it's about playing with the proportions, yes. Maybe want to tilt the head a bit more because this is really cartoony. I really exaggerate the pose. If this was more realistic, then I would probably keep his, uh, his weight more distributed over the correct way because now his center of gravity is, is really in front. So normally he would yeah, he tip would over. <laughs> But because it's cartoony, it's uh, we can get away with it. I try to flip around back and forth between my poses, so I can really see what the movement is doing. So I'm starting with the storytelling poses. Uh, the storytelling poses or the, the key pose, that's it? Well, the key poses are actually uh, a couple of drawings more, I think, because it will also be how he is going there. The storytelling poses is more the stories that are uh, the images that are necessary to really tell the story. Perhaps I, I do a couple of more in between here. The drawing here is really the story I will tell. So the beginning, middle and end of your story and that's it. Thinking about what I'm planning with this shot. <laughs> I'm not sure yet. I'm just thinking, I'm just improvising here. That's also the, the advantage of uh... Being with the software, you can just erase and, and yeah. control Z and... Uh... Yeah, that's so, so fine. Uh, so, so nice. <laughs> I never worked with, for 2D animation on, uh, on paper. Well, only in, in school, but I, yeah, as soon as I was able to do it in the computer, I, I <laughs> went yeah. back to the computer. It's so nice because you can make, for example, a selection and just say, uh, I think his head was a little bit too small or a little bit too much to the left. Uh, for your character design and storyboards and everything, you, you work on something else? No, well, storyboards I really always do in TV paint, actually. Okay. And uh, also for 3D animation, I love to make my line art sketches in TV paint just to try out animations just the same way I do now. Because you can, like you said, you can just draw over it again and make your key poses and think about things a lot faster than you can in 3D. So you see, I did here the poses where he looks and before he goes to this pose, I made a, an anticipation pose. Okay, so he's supposed to work uh, between the two? Yeah, because I want to make him jump and to make a character jump, you really have to anticipate the the jump because the energy has to come from somewhere so i really try to to squash his his legs a little bit and get his uh, arms up high so that if i draw the jump itself i can really stretch him i have to think about this <laughs> And so when you um, squash and, squ and stretch uh, the volume has to be the same but just uh in, yeah. in another uh, like uh, proportion that's yeah it. it's it's really like the the bouncing ball actually if it hits the ground then it gets squashed so you, it keeps the volume and if it shoots away it will do like this and then uh, it will get back into the, the original shape all that energy that is pushed down it has to shoot up again so that's why the, the squash and stretch is happening, actually. I don't remember if uh, this is for uh, projects you have or just for fun and animating. Uh, this is actually for the uh, for the online website I am creating, the character creation guide. I'm going to do a little tutorial about 2D animation as well. And uh, I'm going to create this character actually in 3D, uh, rig it, model it, animate it, uh, but also animated in 2D and in 3D. So and you can also get this as a bundle with all the tutorials in there. So it's actually kind of tutorial bundle for starting artists who want to learn a little bit about the entire process of creating a character. 
and the difference between uh, 2D and 3D and how to you transpose uh, a design to uh, a character in 2D or 3D? I try to design my characters most of the times so that I can do them both in 2D and in 3D. But for a character like this, I also have to really think about how to rig the character because it's such a squash and stretchable character. And I, I will also show this in the in the tutorial itself. It will be a pretty complete uh, tutorial about animation, so it's great. There are a lot of great tutorials out there, but there aren't many that really take on every aspect of the process of uh, creating characters. And I think that's uh, kind of my specialty to do everything. <laughs> and I think people would really like to learn that. So I hope. <laughs> it's kind of funny to, to say uh, my specialty is to do everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's weird. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I think that that has always been one of my stronger points, actually, to be able to do everything because that has helped me so much in my career. And I think it could help so many other people. And that's why I really want to help other people learn so much skills because I really think it can help them. Because I, I, I wondered if, uh, if I would be bored if I do only one part of the process. So I'd like to make it everything by myself. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's so yeah. much fun to switch it up and to uh, to keep working on different things. I think if I would work just on animation for the rest of my life, I would get really bored. Actually. I think so too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I went to uh, the, the Pixar studios uh, a while back, uh, or the Disney studios, I mean, and I was talking to an animator there and he is working on a children's book now just to keep him sane because to have your own projects besides your normal work is really uh, a good way to keep yourself sane. Yeah, because it seems to be a dream to work in a big studio and be an animator for for years and years. But yeah. <laughs> there is also the part uh, you, you do the same thing, even if it's not the same characters and scenes, but you do the same part of the process. So it could be really tiring to do this all day long. And uh, I see uh, people in studios who are like, uh, wow, it's amazing. You can do films on yourself when they see independent yeah. movies. So this is not uh, completely a dream. It, it is a, a big, uh, it is fun to, to make this, but there is also the, the bad part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, I, I guess it still is work, of course. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even if it's the best job in the world, it's uh, it's, it's still, still a job. job. <laughs> yeah. But it's so fun to, to keep your own creativity in this, to play around and not just make the same thing all the time. I'm trying to keep my character just rough and I, I can already see that his head is square. Yeah, it's scaling a bit. Yeah. You see here his head is a lot smaller. But in the first step, I really don't want to worry about this because this is more like thumbnailing for me Okay. to really think about the movements and not to be worried uh, too much about the character because the next step would be to to go over this and to make sure that his head is uh, is the same proportion all the time but because I also work a lot for 3d animation I don't really mind if the proportions aren't perfect because it's more like me thinking about the movement so the movement for me is always more important than the, the actual drawing so for 3d animation do you uh, often or sometimes uh, just make the animation in 2d uh, with rough uh, yeah. sketches to, to have yeah. the right timing and then transpose it to 3d Yes, definitely. It does depend on what kind of animation it is. Uh, I do that especially for body and body acting shots because it's so much quicker to to just get the body, the shapes you want. And it can be really helpful if you are animating to uh, keep the line of actions correct. Because in 3D, you, you sometimes forget about the line of actions when you're posing your character. And if you draw it, it's it's more natural to to draw the correct uh, line of action. But I do draw over my 
uh, facial animations to if something isn't working correctly or something then i can just uh, try to exaggerate like the eyebrows and the eyes and sometimes you get nicer poses just by drawing something than by posing a 3d character see because you can really easy get uh, a nice line when you're drawing how do you deal with uh, the weight of, uh, of a character when you're animating? Yeah, it's uh, it's all about acting as if there is weight. So uh, this is a very light character. So he, uh, because it's a bird, he doesn't have that much weight. But uh, if it's a really big character, for example, you really have to think about the poses to really show the weight in the poses itself. So for example, a character like this, you see the weight is like pulling him down. So all the, the bigger parts are at the bottom, for example. If it's a really light character, then the, the gravity is probably up higher, like this. So you, yeah, it depends on, on the character and on the acting. It's the same with uh, carrying the box. If you have a box and it's really heavy, then you really have to act out that it's heavy by really thinking about the arcs in expressions to really convince the audience that it is a heavy box. Yeah, that's a, a really difficult part of it. Yeah, yeah it's, but uh, it's also something if you have more experience with animation that uh, it's something you have to really think about when you're starting out. But if you have more experience, then you, uh, it becomes more natural to you. So, okay. it, yeah, it does take practice. Because uh, I remember about, uh, it was in The Incredibles uh, making of, and uh, I think it was John Cash, the animator, who talked with uh, Brad Bird, the director, to say, uh, how do I show someone really strong but something is really heavy. How do I deal with this? So he's a superhero, but uh, at the yeah. same time, it's a really <laughs> heavy statue. And uh, in the film, it's, uh, it's great to see, but it, it seems to be a, a great challenge for the animators. Yeah, you have to really think about that, especially in what you're saying, because it's such a contrast with something that is really heavy, but a strong character. Yeah. So you, yeah, it's, it's really difficult. It's the same with uh, if, uh, you have a really tall character, then, uh, for example, the dragons in, in How to Train Your Dragons 2, I think, then you have this immense dragon, and how do you show that it's such a big dragon? It's in the way it moves. It, it moves really slowly, and especially in comparison to the smaller characters uh, that are lower, especially in extreme examples like that, you really have to think about it and it can be really challenging, yeah. <laughs> even if you have a lot of experience. It's the same with uh, creating arcs in your animation. Uh, at first, I really had to think about arcs, uh, like how characters move, but now it's, yeah, because I have so much experience, I, I just know that if an arc is working, I can look at someone's animation and see, oh, the problem is there because I can, I've trained my eye to, to see those uh, mistakes actually. And I see them in my own work as well. Yeah, we always see mistakes uh, in uh, our own work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's good, I think. <laughs> if yeah. you couldn't see it, then, uh, because we are also always a little bit blind to our own uh, to our own work i guess yeah and there is also the the moment of uh, frustration when you see a mistake but you are not able yet to to fix it oh yes <laughs> that can be very annoying yeah. i i remember uh, when i started my career as an animator i was so frustrated because i i didn't grasp the 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 idea behind slow ins and slow outs yet and i was just frustrated that all my work was so linear and so the same and i but i just didn't get it yet and yeah it took me a pretty long time actually to learn it but uh, yeah it helped me a lot when i did and and now i i am laughing that i couldn't see it 
back then. But yeah, that's just, you don't learn animation in a day. You, it takes years to, to really learn animation. And so now you have all your poses. Yeah. <laughs> so when I play this back, I can really see where it's going way too fast. So I just move the keyframes. So I think before he goes, he should really take his time to look at it. So this is just experimenting, um, checking. I think his squash should be a little bit longer. You see how much timing can change your, yeah, super your personality super as well. And so then when you have your, your timing with the, the key poses, you, you make the in-betweens and then you had the, the details like uh, uh, head moving slightly, uh, eye blinking. Yes, yes, and yeah. uh, make more slow ins and slow outs. So a really important thing uh, in animation is to, to really ease into something. So uh, it's, for example, this one and this one then I don't want him to snap into this, but I really want him to ease into this. So this frame would be really close to the to the next one. And here I have to make sure that it's not entirely here yet. If you can see what I mean. Yeah, I see it, yeah. So it can be really subtle, but it, uh, it makes the, the personality of the character. Yeah, and it makes him really uh, soft, I think, the, the movement. If you cushion it like this, then it, yeah. You see, it's, yeah. it's really <laughs> like, yeah, he becomes more, uh, how do you say? as if you can touch him. And that's uh, how I go through everything, actually. Here, I would make more of an ease in. So the frame between this one and this one would edge more towards this one. With a little stretch. Yeah. So and you can play around with, with timing as well, because his arm is now here and now it's here. And we decided that the head should edge more towards the previous frame. But for the arm, for example, I can say that it's already almost up. It's really better to, to make sure the arms and the head move on a different pace. We used to uh, make uh, charts for uh, animation for tri triple trouble. And it's really old fashioned, but it's really cool. Because for the head, I would say that this is frame zero and this is frame six so and i would have to say that this frame is the, in the middle so you have like this this would be four so i would know that the middle frame would be on the fourth frame so uh, and that would make sure that the yeah the ease in was more towards here because there are more frames between the zero and the four than there are between the four and the six. Do you get it? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I never understood that, but I, I think <laughs> no, I get it's, it now. It's, <laughs> it's difficult, but uh, for example, this is for the body, but we could make a different chart for the arms. Here, the chart is also from frame zero to six. But in the middle, we have frame two. You see? I can show it with uh, two balls, actually. Yeah. So this is frame uh, zero. This is frame six. So we move from here to here. Okay. But on the top one, we have the middle frame on the fourth. So yeah. Um, turning on this one. This is not the middle. <laughs> so here we have it on the fourth and here we have it on the second. On the top one, we have the in between on frame two. Yeah. And on the bottom one, we have the in between on frame four. Okay. So that's actually what this chart is. 
So we just say that the middle frame is on the fourth keyframe. But you see, you you tell that way that uh, how the ease is in and ease out were. Yeah, it takes a little bit of practice, but <laughs> it's uh, especially if you're working with an assistant, then this is really important to learn. And if you make it uh, in the wrong way, your animation will suck. <laughs> so, but yeah, then you're only yourself to blame. Maybe we can see the the file from the previous animation with this guy. If you yes, it. here is my uh, previous one. So you can see it's just as quick as the other one. This took me about half a day, uh, for half an hour. Sorry. Wow. <laughs> It's not make. the same. <laughs> no, it's not the same. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's just really quick. I really like the movement of the egg, like the way he, <laughs> he falls. I have an anticipation for the anticipation in this one. And then when he falls, he bounces back. So you have a little bit of overshoot with the egg. Yeah, and the eye is like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's not keeping volume that great, but uh, it's, uh, like I said, it's really quick. If I would animate this properly, I would go over this again and make sure that everything is uh, in correct proportion. But for the idea, this is perfect. So. Yeah, so it can be a, a reference for another animation you, you will make in the future. Yeah, especially if I, I'm going to make this character in 3D, then I know that oh, I have to be able to to stretch his body and his legs like this and have to make sure his eyes can do this and his beak. Yeah. So yeah, this really helps me if I'm going to make a character in 3D to, to make sure that the character is able to do all this in 3D. And maybe I'll make this, this animation in 3D as well. Maybe you have a uh, last uh, advice to people who want to be animator or just to work in animation because there is not only animation. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I think don't give up is the most important one. If Even if things are not going the way you think they should go or the timing, it, it doesn't matter. If you just keep at it, you, you'll get there. You know, it's it just takes a lot of time. And don't worry if you can't work at Pixar when you're 25. There are so many. Uh, options you have and so many wonderful things that can come on your path if you just stick at it. So yeah, I, I guess that's the most important thing. But also take a little bit of time for yourself because stress can be a very dangerous thing. And I see it everywhere around me. So uh, people say, yeah, you have to draw every day. And I think that's really good. And I think you will improve really a lot. But take time for your friends and your family and just relax <laughs> so it can be very important so thank you for your time and uh, yeah, it was it was great to, to talk with you so i, I would just uh, say that uh, we can go to the, to your blog and website to to have some uh, feedbacks to, for demo reels and animation and everything you, yeah, you said definitely so it would be a demo like this but just for your personal work so it's great yeah <laughs> And uh, you can also try uh, TV Paint if you want. There is a link in the description for you to get the, the demo for free and uh, and try everything. So you can also uh, uh, repeat the animation uh, you just did. with uh, You have the example, so you can do this too. Yes, you should. <laughs> I would love to see it. Mm -hmm.